Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Avatar IRL, Amir Bonifatami and Jackie Mori. It's a big crowd. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Very nice meeting you. This is Jackie Mori and I'm here myself from XPRIZE. Well, happy to have you and we're going to start talking about something very interesting, which is a new prize called Avatar. And uh, there we go. Let's start. So, how many of you know uh, about XPRIZE? All of you. Hmm. So, you probably know that we are probably the world's largest prize organization company, and we create, we create very large challenges, as we call it, to solve the world's grandest challenges of our time. Or other ways said, try to make the impossible possible. This is our motto, and this is uh, what we are striving for. We're very excited today to, to present to you one of our latest prizes. But let's start first by giving you a snapshot of how Express came to be about and what was the inspiration behind it. You probably remember or have heard about a competition that happened Many years ago, in 1919, was the spirit of San, the, the, the competition was going from New York to Paris on a plane, and the competition was $25,000, and it was given by a French hotelier, and the idea was to basically promote the space uh, and commercial aviation. A number of people applied, and the winner was Charles Lindbergh, which was, excuse me, <coughs> not really the most uh, trained pilot or, 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 or person, but he managed to find a way to travel from the Atlantic and win the prize. The, 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 uh, the output of this prize, which was $25,000, was that many, many companies tried to create a plane and, and fly and, and win. And the winner, Lindbergh, had actually le less uh, capabilities and money than many others ones, but it, he won. The, the output of that was that it, it opened up a whole commercial uh, endeavor right after that, about 300% more people tried to get the private license, uh, increase in, in license aircraft in by one, the first year, a number of, uh, I think probably 30 million, million people visited the Spirit of Sandwich, which is a plane that was born, and about more than a few hundred startup or companies were created at that time, tackling this new industry, which was commercial airline and, and going to, into travel. So that was basically the inspiration of, of, uh, of what Peter Diamandis, the founder of XPRIZE, uh, read in a book and, and found a way that started XPRIZE. His dream was to go to space. And to go to space, there's really no way to go to space if you're not in, 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 in NASA or, or military. And he wanted to do that. So he designed a prize at that time, inspired by Charles Lindbergh, to go to space. And the prize was designed the following way. How can we find a way to go into the atmosphere fly 100 kilometer in altitude twice a week with a three-person crew. That was the design. So he just basically created that and find a sponsor to put $10 million to give the prize. This prize was, of course, welcomed by many people, 26 teams exactly, from seven different countries. And the interesting part is that for a $10 million prize, those teams spend more than $100 million to basically be able to create that plane and, and, uh, and, and win. The winner of that prize was an engineer called uh, Bert Rattan, and uh, the spaceship one was the plane that he designed and flew and actually won the prize. This prize was won by, uh, by him, and later on, Charles, uh, Richard Branson, excuse me, I have uh, water. Richard Branson purchased the license of, uh, of this plane and started Virgin Galactic. Thank you very much. So that was really the launch of XPRIZE. XPRIZE got born out of this prize, which was Spaceship One. And Spaceship One opened up a whole industry which was going to space. At that time, entrepreneurs didn't go to space. They were building software, they were building hardware, they were doing other things, but space was not an opening for anyone. That opened up the whole space industry and later on SpaceX and many other companies. Today, uh, what we call an XPRIZE is a highly leveraged prize, modeled after this initial prize where a number of uh, 
uh, people are, are incentivized to really tackle a grand challenge and come up with solutions. The, the prize is highly incentivized and very specific about this outcome. Today we are, uh, in a summary, we're uh, on, on a number of prizes at the same time. We have awarded about $150 million worth of prize purse to a number of teams. I'm going to go through some of them. And we have a, another $200 million prize under development or about to be launched. And let's look at some of them right now. So one of the prizes that was actually awarded uh, last year in April of 2017 is called the Qualcomm Prize. The, the name of Qualcomm is from the sponsor that, uh, that gave the winner the prize. It's a $10 million prize purse. The idea was to create five years ago a device that would give anyone access to enough reading from your body to be able to have a diagnostic about the situation, the outcome of what you're facing. And 300 teams registered and we had nine finalists and two winners that was awarded in 2017. This was inspired by the movie Star Trek where, if you remember, there was a little device called the tricorder that was, that was used. Uh, under the prize that we're very proud of, which is running right now, which is called the Global Learning Prize uh, and funded by Elon Musk himself, is a $15 million purse prize. And the idea is to give to every child in the world the ability to read, write, and do basic arithmetic in just a few months. And this prize right now is currently running we started with 700 teams, and uh, 135 actually started building solutions, and right now we're down to five finalists, and the prize will be awarded next year, in April of, of, uh, of uh, 2019. Those five teams right now are working with a number of schools uh, in Tanzania, 200 exactly, and try to experiment a number of software that is written and loaded without any network connectivity on Android tablets to be tested by students. Those tablets were given by Google, and a number of um, um, solar cell panels were also installed to charge those tablets. So right now we're running those experiments, and those five teams are doing what we call field test, which is the ability for them to test their solutions in the field, in reality, to demonstrate that actually this can happen, because we need a few months for children going from zero capability to basic uh, skills of reading, writing, and, and arithmetic. Uh, another uh, set of prizes that we are uh, working around right, right now, we have uh, the global learning I've talked about. We have a prize called uh, Ocean Discovery. The, uh, the Ocean Discovery is about, is about mapping the ocean floor. Think of Google Maps for the ocean. How much do we know about the oceans? We know more about the moon and, the, and Mars right now, but when you think about it, if you can have access to a uh, good amount of depth, such as 100 meters down the ocean floor and know what life is over there and what the biological compound is and what, what is the makeup of the ocean, it will not only help with preservation but also with tourism and many other aspects. So this is a prize that we're running. Nine teams are currently working on it and the prize purse is seven million. The adult literacy is another one which uh, is also ongoing. We have eight teams left out of a few hundred starting and, and we're still interesting that we have more than 300 million people in the world, adult people in the world that don't know how to read or write. Uh, three other teams, uh, three other prizes that, uh, that you're showing on the screen. One of this carbon prize, which is a $20 million uh, prize, which is about sequestering carbon and creating new materials out of it. Um, we have the, uh, the water abundance and, and, women, uh, and, and, and women prize, which is about preserving women against bullying and security of women. And the water is basically capturing water from the atmosphere. So in re re uh, remote places of the earth, you can actually capture wa water and build water. The, the, the current prize that we're also running is the uh, AI prize, which is running right now. We have about 60, uh, roughly 60 teams left uh, out of uh, a few hundred starting. This is a $5 million prize, and the goal is to demonstrate applications of AI for grand challenges. So as you have heard, many of you, applications of AI into self-driving cars, transportation, uh, marketing automation, and many other areas of AI into chatbots or others, but this prize is about really tackling grand challenges such as drought, agriculture, um, preserving wildlife, uh, discovery of patterns in the atmosphere, uh, new form of life, and those 60 teams are working on many, many domains, including healthcare, education, uh, as examples. So this prize is also running right now, it's a $5 million prize. Uh, today we have, uh, we go, we're going to be talking to you about the, really the next prize, which is the main topic of today, which is the, uh, uh, the Avatar Prize. And Jackie is going to 
share more with you. Yeah, so I will t talk a little bit about the Avatar X Prize, which is uh, funded by ANA, the Japanese Airlines. And this prize was just launched uh, at South by Southwest in March. So this is a fairly new prize. Um, what is it about? It's a different definition of avatar than most of you in the VR community really might think about. These avatars are actually physical avatars that someone can pilot from a distance. So they're remote, but the person piloting that avatar over space can actually feel and see and hear what the avatar is sensing at that end location. So very much like a telepresence aspect of avatars. Uh, so this could happen anywhere in the world eventually. Uh, the big thing that we're trying to do at XPRIZE is bring together and integrate a lot of technologies that might not otherwise get integrated. Manufacturers and, and enterprise tends to focus on one or two things and not the integration of these. This Avatar Prize probably has more domains that need to be integrated than anything that's ever been done by XPRIZE. So it's a big challenge, it's a big risk, but we're really excited to see what comes in. So um, not just improvements, but total transformation, things that can disrupt the way we live, work, travel, and, and connect with each other. So what would you use such an avatar for? Let's look at a couple of the scenarios that we've come up with, and these are not the only ones, but providing care. So in China, you know, kids go off to the city to make their living, but the aging parents are at home. This way you could actually have a robot in the home and be working in the big city and still take care of your parents. Really have some sense of being and some sense of with them. So this is one idea, disaster relief. So one thing a digital avatar can't do is move debris, find people, carry them out of a disaster situation. So a physical avatar would be very, very helpful in that, um, in that kind of situation. Or if it's too dangerous and you don't want to send a human in. Uh, robots probably are going to be a little more expendable than humans. And then multi-purpose ones. So imagine a day when everybody has a robot in their closet, and it's a multi-purpose robot, and you need your washing machine fixed, so the washing machine repairman jumps into your robot from a distance, doesn't have to make a house call, you don't have to wait for him, fixes your machine. Or that same kind of robot could be operated by um, a surgeon who needs to do an emergency appendectomy. Um, so that kind of multi-purpose robot could be very, very helpful in the future. So I'm going to let Amira talk about how we even get to such a prize like this, because that process is fascinating. So as you discover more about examples of prizes that we have launched before, and this one particular one, let's go through the perspective of how this one came about. Obviously, the combination of collaboration between man and machine is a big topic on the background. We believe that this is not about man or machine, it's about collaboration between the two. And a physical avatar, a robot, is a good example to showcase that. So what we do is that from a design perspective, we gather every year a number of ideas. Those ideas are nurtured by a number of teams, and those teams take between four to five months to think and design what a prize should be and what the prize impact could be. And then they expose it once a year to an event called Vision Years that we organize, and that event rallies uh, about, about 250 people coming from all walk of life to, for us to get a feedback on how they perceive what they think if the timing right and what with the impact method or, or criteria that we have come up with makes sense to them. So this initial step, basically think of it as a better version, as, as a prize design effort. So at that time, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, All Nippon Airways sponsors a little team of four people trying to work on a concept of an avatar simply because they thought that the future of travel and transportation might not just be a plane. It could be us being able to transport ourselves somewhere else. And what would that mean? How can we transport? Should we beam it ourselves? Or should we, which is too far distant in the future and too much probably unrealistic today? What could we do today with a combination of technologies? So basically, they, they, they basically sponsors and work on this and, fund, uh, and thought about a, a, an avatar that could benefit humanity as a whole. That would be the design of it. And, and of course, 
uh, this was one of the nine prizes that we have. We have basically nine teams competing. One of them was about cancer, and the one was about uh, carbon sequestration, and Avatars was one of them. But Avatar was awarded, right, at 2016, which is our yearly design competition, if you will, uh, the, 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 the proposal which was deemed ready to launch. So because of that, we, we, we took another nine months to design the prize completely, and Avatar was the natural sponsor. And they said, we're going to give a $10 million purse to whoever is the first team that could create a set of technologies where an, a physical avatar, multi-purpose physical avatar, can be remotely controlled by a human in so many different scenarios that Jackie mentioned. So the, 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 the winner has to do this. This is how we design the prize, and this will evolve, of course. But the winner team will have to combine a number of technologies to demonstrate how a robotic avatar will be able to allow an untrained operator to complete the diversity of tasks. For instance, if I'm a doctor, I'm not a trained operator of a robot, but how easy it could, should that be for a doctor or for a plumber or for a firefighter to be able to control remotely an avatar to be able to handle a task, which is a medical task or a physical task of saving someone in disaster recovery. And it has to be done within 100 kilometer away. So it means a number of things. It means that you have to have network capabilities. It means that you have to give the person who's the operator capabilities to see remotely with VR and AR and others, and Jackie will explain that. It means that also you have to have some form of AI in it in terms of capturing um, and having machine vision capability to, to detect objects. And, and, and uh, and you're going to hear about that a bit sooner. So this is basically what the prize has to do. The winner has to do this uh, to be able to be rewarded the, the, the $10 million. But uh, look, let's look at the timeline. Right now, we are really at the beginning phase or where teams are starting to register, and we're getting public feedback on those guidelines. The guidelines are pretty much the competition manual of how a team will spend the next two or three years to compete. And we basically expose this on our website, the general public, so everyone can give a feedback on whether they want to add something to it or they think something is not critically important or anything. And we have feedback from experts in the industry, we have feedback from academics, we have feedback from anyone. We capture those and then we, we publish those guidelines. Teams are going to be competing uh, to, to be approved as a competing team between now and end of this year. And then they will have yearly milestones to deliver some of those results. And the, the competition will end in 20, uh, 2021, where the prize will be awarded. Uh, one question is that many people ask us is that why should they compete? Well, this is a good question. Some, some teams are extremely technical. Some are not technical. Some are coming from a domain of expertise such as medicine but they're not thinking about the robot or any form of technology to, to, to do that. So the competition really is for us an opportunity to leverage the crowd and come to participate and develop breakthrough solutions. You typically, an XPRIZE is, 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 is created when the market may not think of that opportunity as a market solution. For instance, venture capital will not invest into a startup just doing this because this is too much of a take. Or governments may not be interested in funding projects that do, do that. Of course, for instance, DARPA would, may have a competition on robotics, but they may not push it this way, which is for a three or four year period, you're going to solve problems and not the technical challenge only. So because we're thinking about breakthrough solutions, we need the crowd to come and, and join forces and to come up with ideas and, and scenarios where that leap can happen. And, and there are many reasons for people to compete. Of course, the price purse is a make is, is, is a motivation because it's a non-dilutive gift, if you will, but it's also about joining a movement where sometimes we have seen in the XPRIZE that the, some teams have been started by two moms and they had an idea about education and they gathered around them specialists in education, specialists in technology, uh, policy making, and they created a team and they just wanted to, to, to be part of that. Uh, it's also for teams to be part of an ecosystem. We have access to the best minds, best experts in any area, and there are expert advisors, supporters of those teams. So for a team, it's an opportunity also to, to be accessing that, that, that group. It also gives global media attention. All our teams are getting visibility. We do yearly summits in different parts of the world. We expose them. We have ways to get them presented to, 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 to funding sources, to media, to get attention about why they do this and, and what their thinking is. 
is also a validation because by being exposed to a much larger ecosystem uh, is, is a validation of your, your ideas if you're a team. It's also allowing teams to keep their intellectual property. Winning a prize doesn't mean they have to give away of any product or, or service they may launch later on. It's also really a, a, a way to, to, uh, to have access to facilities and testing that may not be otherwise available. For instance, on the, on, on the Ocean Prize, we, went to, we wanted to clean up the, the oil spill. We actually built a few million dollars facility for teams to actually be able to demonstrate the technology. If they wanted to do it by themselves, it would have been really difficult and very costly. So all the things that we do at Express to help teams to have a sandbox of experimentation, have support from an ecosystem, have access to funding, be visible, be excited, is what makes an XPRIZE team interesting. And of course, passion is the number one reason why people enter. And if they want, don't win, at least participation is the first step for them to be part of that. So I'll, I'm going to have Jackie to explain more about why AR and VR are so instrumental in this class. Thanks. So yeah, you may wonder, this seems to be more about robotics and AI. How does it even relate to the people that come to VRLA? Where does VR or AR or any of the immersive technologies play a role in this? Um, so it took me a while to wrap my head around it, but there are many overlapping technologies. As I said, this Avatar X Prize is one that brings together so many different disciplines and domains to make this happen. So here are some of the things that I think are overlapping technologies. So head-mounted displays so that you might be able to see what the robot's seeing, 4D effects so you can feel what the robot's feeling, eye tracking so um, you can have your eyes manipulate what the robot's seeing. So it's, it's kind of this interesting feedback loop of all of these technologies, haptic devices. Certainly the robot has to map out the space in front of it. Um, there's a lot of AI, so the robot can figure out what's happening and, and relay the right um, information back to the operator. So these are just some of the things that I think are overlaps uh, in a course in, um, in picture form, I mean imagine having something like a Tesla suit that not only allows you to control that distant avatar, but also sends back signals as to what that avatar is feeling or touching, uh, that type of thing. Um, being able to control stuff with VR technologies is one of the, the first ways, I think. But I think as these teams are formed, they're going to find more and more ways that they can bring in people from the AR and VR immersive technology, technology communities to really be part of a team. You don't have to be the whole team. You become part of one of the teams that we're hoping to put together. Um, so that's some of the ways that it could work. And the registration is now open, so you can say that you're interested, and we're gonna actually probably do a little more putting teams together so that um, we can get the right mix of these technologies and experts to working together to come up with something truly unique and truly transformative for humanity. So that's the uh, website, the Avatar X Prize. Uh, we're also looking for ambassadors all over the world to help get the word out. We will do workshops in different cities to let people know what is um, out there and what we expect from teams and to help get teams formed. We might do a few hackathons around the world. So this, um, this website is where you can sign up and find out all of those things that are gonna be happening. Um, We'd like to thank ANA, so this is a Japanese airline that is funding this prize. The future of travel may not be getting on an airplane, which I think is awfully um, amazing for them to think that the future may actually be a very different business than what they're in now, but it's all about connecting people. So we really thank them. A little video for you.
So that's pretty much the presentation, but we do have time for questions because I know if you're like me, there's going to be a lot of questions. And I'll answer one, no, we don't expect an untrained operator to do abdominal surgery on anybody for, <laughs> for, for part of the contest. <laughs> so we have microphones that will be passed around. We can't see you too well, but we'll, we'll hear you and answer. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Hey, good afternoon. A great presentation, very uh, exciting and stimulating. Uh, two questions. So you mentioned in the beginning that the venture capitalists, they don't want to come on board now because of the risk, but then when you go through the tests, and the technology is at a higher level and ready to deliver, do they come back in later? And this is that's kind of related to the end game of, so how does the development's transition to commercial application uh, to the industry where you've got the, com the community that's going to benefit and then you've got stakeholders that are investing. Yeah, I can take that. Uh, the venture capital industry investors are always on the lookout for product and services and companies that will make uh, a large return and impact on society. It is not always evident from the beginning of a competition what the teams are going to be creating in terms of product or service. There is sometimes a lot of thinking that happens. So some teams actually are startups and they're already on, on the verge of building a very clear product and they compete in the competition to have a better visibility, better opportunity to, to, to deploy or they have no idea about the product services. So that interest from the VC committee is very high at the beginning of a competition. Sometimes some teams are already funded. Sometimes they get funded six months into it. Because teams keep their intellectual property, they are at free will to, to develop any product or service they want. And we have observed that usually the first year is the mark where a number of teams have a more clear idea about what that product might be. And in addition to the competition, they go on their own way and raise funding. Many teams are academic teams. Many teams are formed of uh, multidisciplinary elements, such as someone working in government or someone working in academia, they may not think of creating a company at all. They just want to tackle that problem. For instance, the Qualcomm Tricorder Prize, the team was a team of three doctors. They were working in a hospital in Philadelphia. They had no idea about creating a company and to raise funding. They just needed resources. So those resources might be grant, might be funding, and sometimes those conversations may reveal opportunities for teams to create a company or to be part of a larger ecosystem or to join other team. And we see a lot of movement between teams. So it's a, a very interesting ecosystem that develops itself. It is not a typical incubation or typical way that we can see out there. I hope I'm answering your question. Um, I had a, a quick question about this, this project, more so than some of your other projects, seems like it's a higher order technology kind of project where you have a lot of base technology that already exists that's probably going to have to be integrated in this. How, how much are the teams expected to innovate and are they expected to innovate, at, like is one team expected to innovate in all areas in order to achieve this or do you expect that there'll be a robotics portion like group and a control group and a visualization group that are different groups that are working separately or maybe across multiple teams? I'm going to answer in two steps. Maybe Jackie has some answers first. So if you look at the guidelines, go online and look at the guidelines and it actually says what we're es expecting the test to be. So you will need to put those teams together to have the robot do whatever. It might be, you know, push a wheelchair up a ramp, uh, figure out the meds that someone has to have, give them the meds, talk to the doctor. There's a number of those scenarios on there. They're, the, and then they're, they're um, scored. So then the high scores would get that. So they might not have one component, but overall they would get as much as they could integrated to meet the, uh, the challenge and the tasks. So what we're really looking for now is feedback on those guidelines. Um, some of those tasks are very simple. Some of them are fold up the blanket and put it on the shelf. Uh, it's still hard for robots to fold up blankets unless it's a robot, uh, blanket folding robot. So, um, and then a lot of the stuff just hasn't come back yet. What robots sense and how that comes back to the operator, that's just not there yet. So there's some big challenges. We don't expect everybody to get everything perfect. This is a forcing function to see what can work together. 
And in terms of innovation, just a second part um, is that usually we see very innovative approaches, more than technology approaches, which is very important because it may be very well that someone in a lab or somewhere has developed a haptic capability that we don't think about. But because teams are trying to research and find out how they can integrate those, that integration creates new methods of solving problems and sometimes new novel ways to look at, at, uh, at, at, at that opportunity. Many, many uh, teams are not developing novel solutions because novel solutions usually are done in labs, academia, research. We're not trying to make them researchers. We're trying to say, what can you borrow from research and your own knowledge and how can you join forces with others that are doing this to actually tackle that? And, and the guideline that Jackie mentioned is pretty much how we want them to think about it. And we can increase the difficulty or lower the difficulty. If the difficulty would be to a robot remotely, to be able to have empathy and hug someone and feel why they're depressed, well, that might be more difficult than folding blanket, as, as, as you mentioned. But we may not need to go there, right? But at the same time, we observe that teams create many, many, many new and different ideas that we have never thought about. And this is where the whole white space opens up. These are the, the unintended consequences of a price. Hi there, Greg Panos here. Um, if the blanket folding robot doesn't win, it can still name itself Linus. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question I have is, um, the word avatar uh, has become kind of a catch-all phrase that is a little indistinct today. Uh, it used to be more generally referred to for any embodiment uh, that was driven or used as a proxy for a human being. So in this particular context, um, I, I think it's being used uh, more or less to uh, associate with telepresence or teleoperation of uh, tasks that are performed. And uh, some of the uh, parameters that you're talking about are a requirement for the device, have you, or avatar to be performed by a human being live or to also be autonomous but somehow that there's some human being or human-like intuition or behavior that has been imbued into the whole performance scheme of the device. And the other, the other thought that I was having or question might be, um, as far as uh, anthropomorphism is, uh, is, is associated with avatarism or avatars per se, meaning uh, looking like or a, a human being, there isn't a strict requirement in the prize about anthropomorphism. Uh, it could be some type of device that doesn't particularly look like a, a bifurcated, uh, two-legged, standing, two-eyed uh, vehicle, uh, apart maybe from the need for stereoscopy for depth sensing. But uh, the people that are starting to apply for this or would, would be motivated to apply for it wouldn't necessarily do so because they want to create something that looks kind of like a person, right? Uh, it would be a, a much broader motivation that they might have uh, to participate in this kind of prize. Uh, perhaps you might want to speak to right, that. I, well, I think, I think this particular prize is all about inclusive design. So whatever works, and it doesn't have to be, it has to be able to navigate, it has to be able to get around, it has to be able to do certain things. It might need some manual dexterity, but that could be a very different form factor than a, a humanoid robot. So you're right, we're not saying it has to be a humanoid robot. We'd love to see some other kinds of things that, um, you know, we tend to give a lot of uh, human qualities to things that don't even look like humans. I mean, how many times have you yelled at your computer? Okay, so it, we ascribe those qualities to all of our machines. Uh, it, it might be a little easier if they look like a human, but that doesn't mean we're not going to have, you know, the 22nd century equivalent of Clippy walking around with us, and we like we like that Clippy thing, and we're gonna we're gonna bond to it in some way, even if it's not a humanoid type of, of, of appearance. So yeah, there's no, there's no requirement to make it humanoid or even symmetrical. Hi. Uh, you outlined a few applications that you're looking for specifically in terms of disaster relief and medical applications. Is there a preference for teams to tackle those specific subjects? Or uh, obviously, I would, I would hope that you would look for people to solve other 
other challenges, but is there a specific need for to address those in the first place? Uh, no, these are just inspirational and to highlight potential usage. We are requiring teams to do a certain number of things, and these are the missions or the scenario that Jackie mentioned. So when the guidelines are going to be giving feedback from all of you, hopefully, we capture those and we create a number of scenarios that teams have to be doing to demonstrate that they have the technology, the capability. But outside of that, teams come up with either because they have an idea of a product that they can be funded for, or many other reasons, or they're in research, they may go way beyond that. And they could actually find applications that were never thought of. And this is the opportunity. The opportunity for us as an enterprise is to open up a whole white space of collaboration between man and machine and have those questions that you mentioned surface and have a more dialogue around it. We're not at all a judge in this, right? We're just saying we create the playground and let the crowd come and join forces and discuss it. And some teams will win because we have to have a, a protocol or, or, <laughs> or, or a framework. But outside of that, the most amazing things happen because individuals and teams come up with the most surprising ideas. And then are the two of you uh, on the judges panel for the, the final of this? We are not. We are actually the, um, we, we help synchronize and coordinate and, and put into operations and gather the resources around it, such as experts, uh, labs, and others, and make sure teams have the mo more resources. But we usually create an independent judging panel, which doesn't talk to us and faces the teams and evaluate uh, without our knowledge. So we're completely as armed blessed and, and independent. And, and those kinds of scenarios, I'll say, we don't expect somebody to send a robot out to a disaster area and try and you know s fix anything. These are more um, isolated, stepped tests that just say, the robot can do this, the robot can do that, the operator feels this, the operator understands that. They're not necessarily in location tests. They will be done in a testing facility where we've set up things that uh, give those opportunities to the robot to do, and then we'll see how well the robot's done. So the actual implementation within some of those scenarios, you know, for, for surgery or for disaster relief or for multipurpose, those are the next phase. So this is the inspiration phase. Let's see what they can do. And then you put them together for specific opportunities afterwards. Another question. Hi, uh, I'm just curious. I would think that a lot of these teams, like that's their full-time occupation. Uh, a company will put together an XPRIZE team and those people are working full-time around the clock on this. Or do you foresee more independent people, like they have a full-time job and this is something that they kind of do on the weekends and the evenings <laughs> and they contribute, but it's not like full-time commitment? Uh, if we look at historical data, uh, we, have all, we have three separate buckets. We have teams that are fully committed and they're doing it full time and even more than full time. We have teams that are coming from research, academia, they are very in, in, in the border adjacency of those domains and this, they take this opportunity as I already am doing certain things and I'm going to use it to, to, to make some progress. So they put probably half time in it or some, some form of time. And we have the third bucket is teams that are coming from a domain, not the technologies of a domain. For instance, they think about health as an issue or disaster as an issue or, or man and machine or um, anthropomorphism. And they are getting inspired about forming a team with other individuals to, to compete. And the amount of time that teams put together is really variable among, uh, along the line of life of the prize. Sometimes they have to put a lot of effort at the beginning and sometimes they they have one year to deliver a milestone, they may not get to work full time on it. So it's very, very much depending on the team, on the context, and the timing during the competition. Hi, uh, I have a question about, um, is there a morality component to this? Uh, meaning that for robotics, we can have, you know, first rule robots or whatever, mm -hmm. but Human nature is a little more complicated than that. Um, have you have you guys incorporated any of these thoughts at all into this? I don't think it's in the guidelines specifically. Um, I, I think we're kind of at the beginning stages, and a lot of the a lot of the discussions about robots and what they can do or autonomous 
uh, vehicles and what they can do is really when you don't have a human operator and, and the robot is out there doing things with a decision-making uh, program that we don't know how ethical some of those decisions are going to be within the context of actually that particular device out there in the world. Um, this one I don't think is going to get to that level at this point. These are really important questions that we all have to think about as we go into the age of autonomous machines, of robotic avatars, AI in, in most aspects of our lives. But I don't think we have them specifically in these guidelines. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussions around it. You know, if, you know what, what if you have uh, N-force effectors that are so not, not uh, detailed enough so that somebody's going to get hurt if they're used. We have to think about those things, but I don't think they're in the guidelines. If, if you think they should be, let us know. Uh, I mean, add a little bit to that. We, of course, we are thinking about the topics that you mentioned. It's not always easy to include in a prize conundrum or, or paradigm all of the conversations, all the ideas, all the possibilities. We need to find a way for us to energize anyone in the world to be part of, of, of a solution building and to solve certain type of problems. For instance, on the AI prize, we have a strong recommendations on data sharing and ethics and, and, and the governance and, and the design elements of an AI and how this can be controlled, audited, auditable, explainable. So we have those partly in the guidelines or, or basically strongly recommended to teams to work on. In this specific prize, we may not need to include that, but the crowd or, or people might actually bring this forward. We may not use them as a, as a, as a, as a judging criteria or maybe add it later on. But if we feel that market is ready to absorb that, that conversation and it be translating into something tangible, we'll do it. Sometimes those conversations may not translate directly into a pathway for us to find results that everybody agrees on. And the point for us is to solve grand challenges and to use technology and, and inspire how technology can be part of that building blocks. Well, everything will not be solved with one prize, but the prize is just a beginning uh, of that. In this prize, think of how can we, and we have al always this conversation between man and machine, and we don't want to be either dystopian or utopian, but how can we incentivize more us to understand what is the building blocks of that. And this conversation probably should be more surfaced. We don't know if it's going to be part of the prize. The prize, think of the prize as how can anyone transport their skills somewhere else? And this is a piece of the bigger chapter. There was another question. Yeah. Uh, other than, other than the, um, I, I know you had a slide up there that was kind of saying some general concepts, but other than the actual financial prize that teams won at the end, what other programs do you guys have in place to incentivize companies and research institutes to kind of join teams? Are there, are there you know, other kind of th programs that you run that bring external partners in? Um, we're at the beginning phase of this. Uh, we can give you examples of other prizes that we have done. For instance, uh, we mentioned the global learning. We organize with the UNESCO and World Food Program access to, in this case, 200 schools where actually those teams have a real place to test for real those software. The ocean I mentioned, we build uh, infrastructure for them to test it. On the AI prize, not only we have partnership with the tech stars and many places like WeWork and others for teams to have a place to gather, to have access to mentorship, access to pitching events. We have uh, negotiated with a number of cities to give public data away for, for AI training. We have worked with, uh, with IEEE and ACM to have north of 2,000 engineers being mentors and resources for teams. Uh, we organize re on a regular basis pitching and, and, and sessions for teams to be exposed to capital and to mentors and others. We also provide them with access to faster APIs from corporations such as Cisco and, and NVIDIA and others. In this context, we'll probably do the same exact thing, probably larger because now we're talking not only about robotics, but AI and haptics and sensors. Maybe we'll work with a number of telecom operators to provide 5G capability advance to show that there is no latency. So we will do all of those. But um, we have to because if we want teams to, 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 to have that leap, we have to give them all the possible tools. But it's not that we have to, we do it because we think we should. And teams usually get those benefits. But teams usually do it for other reasons because 
they get the chance to actually do what they think is important. Yeah, so I, I want to say in terms of VR and telepresence and the kinds of things that we're doing here at VRLA, um, imagine, if you will, back in the early days of VR, if we could have put a challenge to create VR of the future out to everybody instead of having it just be in the labs that were well funded by NASA and the military. Can you imagine where we'd be in VR now? But we are at that stage where so many people can get involved. And now to add to it this, this avatar physical robotics part, we're helping, I think, seed the ideas of new technologies that we haven't dreamed of yet. And we've got this great democratized group of VR, AR, immersive technology creators out there that can bring their talents to bear on this. So I hope some of you decide to get involved, get other people involved, because I think we're, you know, we're at that beginning stage like VR was back in the, in the kind of early 80s, maybe even earlier than that. And there's many ways to get involved. Either you create a team or become, become part of a team or become a mentor or become an advisor or you think you can be a judge or you think you can open up some important conversations where whose time has arrived and this could be a good trigger to open up those conversations more br in a broader way uh, or, or incentivize academia to think about research programs. Whatever you think is important, this is an excuse pretty much <laughs> we're, to, we're an to, excuse. to participate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you.